Um, the talk that I'm going to give you this morning is not the one that was scheduled a week ago. The title is the same. Um, however, um, I was uh, meditating uh, quite persistently on this image, which is the, known as the Violet Flame of Saint-Germain. Count Saint-Germain um, was um, a notable um, individual in his uh, personality life has gone on to become, as we understand it, the Master uh, Rakowski, the Master R, the, uh, the guardian of the seventh ray energy. This is the seventh ray colour. And as a result of the meditation, which was very similar to what we did this morning, led by Toddy, a visualisation, and in a visualisation of the uh, e uh, energy of the seventh ray, the violet flame of Saint-Germain, I was able to bring through the contents of the talk that I'm giving this morning and therefore I'm going to go through with you exactly what came through um, as the talk and as I say it is different but there's some interesting things in there. Now hopefully you're going to get a sheet passed around um, and if you can't see the board don't worry because it's more for my use and to point out things that you're getting on the sheet. Um, there is a lot of symbolism involved and I want to make it clear for all of you what we are talking about. However, before we, we, we start and while you get your, your papers, um, let's talk about the energy of the Piscean Age. We are currently in a transition period, 2008 to 2024 is the transition period of Pisces uh, into Aquarius. And we have transiting Pluto in Capricorn and what Pluto in Capricorn is doing is bringing everything to the surface so that it can be examined. Bringing everything to the surface, look what's happened since 2008. How many things have come to the surface, surface just in public life? And will continue to do so whilst the Pluto will rock the foundations, including the economic stability of the planet, until it is in a fit state to go into the age of Aquarius. And you can read about this in the Bailey books, The Destiny of the Nations, etc., um, the rays and the initiations. And so we have to be braced for a period of change and transmutation because values shift and change from one age to the other. And in the age of Pisces, we know that man took the energies, history records, and took religion and turned it into dogma, and the dogma could come fanatical, and recently even uh, the terrorist has been embraced under so-called religious ideas. And that is man's use of the sixth ray of devotion and idealism. But Pisces is also the age of redemption. And when we look at our own internal charts we see our psyches there and that is our conditioning in time and space it is also showing us where we have aspects where our individual redemption has to be and i see so many people who have got problems trying to redeem certain issues and as my guide will tell me tell them that there is no redemption without forgiveness if we don't have forgiveness in our heart then we're not going to be able to bridge that gap and that issue will be carried forward life after life and indeed we meet many people in this life who we have issues to sort out with. They can be our family, they can be our partners, they can be our work colleagues, they can be uh, any type of relationship that we have or situation we have and we have to go through again. And so uh, the P Pisces brought the idea of forgiveness in through the higher strands of religion but now we have to move on from idealism because the sixth ray is the ray of devotion and idealism and therefore the ray of the religions to something far more practical and in the age of Aquarius we have to spiritualize matter and this is going to come up in a few uh, different angles in the talk today the spiritualization of matter is my definition of magic we hear the word magic a lot and uh, the, the, there are people here who do talks on what exactly magic means. For, for us this morning, it's a spiritualization of matter. 
And therefore, I would say to you that if you have a look at the handout that I've given you uh, right at the top, just before I start, we will see that there are divisions vertically where spirit and matter are included. So I'm looking at point one here and I'm saying that we have got the divisions and one of the divisions is spirit consciousness and matter, the third one along. And of course it was mentioned in the Bavatsky letter yesterday that consciousness is a blend of spirit and matter. And therefore we are looking, uh, if we see that spirit is the life force, we're looking at the subject quite deeply of initiation in the Aquarian age, because initiation is the addition of energy to that person, whoever is receiving it, and it's going to be a group practice, we understand, in the age of Aquarius, uh, energy to the system which brings more life and more consciousness. And we require that energy input when we are ready to be able to take the Aquarian age forward, and so initiation is one of the key factors in this talk. There is a divine plan for evolution, and the age of Aquarius is, as it were, the latest instalment of that plan. The age of Pisces, under the energy of the sixth ray of devotion and idealism, was, as history now records, often used in such a way by mankind that religious dogmatism and even fanaticism has resulted. The age of Aquarius under the seventh ray of ceremonial order and magic, and we'll be looking at these, is a higher vibrational energy characterized by the color violet, which offers humanity the opportunity of a great evolutionary push towards a further realization of the one life. Now the architects of the divine plan, in very broad terms, are the seven rays. My good friend and theosophical compatriot, Gary Kidgel, uh, will be studying these in detail with his uh, uh, group in the second half of this week. And within them, we can perceive a divine trinity. And this itself can be classified in a number of ways. And this is what we have on the first part of your handout. And so, from the top, we have the structures now, the monad, the soul and the personality. We often see the personality as a downward pointed triangle, physical, emotional, mental. The soul as an upward pointed triangle. There's a thread between them called the Antakarana, Atma Buddhi Manas, the qualities of the soul. Divine persistent will is Atma. Divine compassion and unconditional love is Buddhi. And higher Manas, abstract thought, thinking in images and symbols is higher manas. And then we have a further sutratma to the monad, which is our divine spark. And Bailey will classify those, whilst not ignoring that classification, as life, quality and appearance. Life would be the energy, the impulse, the motive power. The monad, the divine spark, requires spiritual staying power. And it does that by manifesting through a soul and a personality so that it is able to be uh, uh, entrenched in material matters so that we are uh, uh, gaining the spiritual staying power. We can return to Godhead, and we will return to Godhead, but we are gaining the fruits of material experience, which is a huge expansion of consciousness that is required to be um, uh, gone through and experienced by that evolution that we call the human. And then the spirit consciousness matter. And I want to re now refer this to the fires that I will be talking about. And initiation is, is, is a fire. Uh, fire by friction or the visible disk of the sun. Solar fire or the heart of the sun. And electric fire the central spiritual sun. And so we have going inwards higher and higher potencies of fire. And the architects of the divine plan, the rays, work through these fires to differing extents, as we shall now see. And we can look at the age of Aquarius at a soul level. The blue line characteristics, the middle characteristics in this first part of the chart, 
um, that I've given out and understand esoterically that under the rulership of the esoteric planet Jupiter, which has that symbol there, and that's the symbol of Aquarius there, Jupiter, under this very beneficial planet, the age will offer opportunities for cooperation, group working, sharing, companionship, social integration, and I'm going to call this the esoteric octave of the new age. This beautiful glyph uh, is reminiscent of a swan or a yacht, and this glyph of Aquarius uh, is reminiscent of waves or World Wide Web. And Goethe, the German philosopher in the 1930s, coined the phase morphology. This is a key feature of esoteric astrology. Shape related to function. Shape related to function. I would throw another one in and say, for example, we'll be talking about it later. There's the glyph of Aries. Aries rules the central nervous system. There's the two hemispheres of the brain and the spinal cord, which make up, make up the central nervous system. And so we see in the symbols of astrology of the form world. And of course, that's very important because we need to be able to relate astrology if we're looking at somebody's health condition or if we're looking at a situation where they have some karma to pay off to do with the family, etc. We need to understand morphology. And this, as I say, is Jupiter and Aquarius. And this is at the soul level or the blue level, the second line down on your sheet. But Age of Aquarius is for humanity. It's not for sections of humanity. It is for humanity, regardless of the difference in consciousness. And it goes further than that. It's for the other kingdoms of nature. And we know that the difference between human humans within humanity is the degrees of consciousness are different. And so it is with the animal kingdom and the plant and flower, uh, the flowering plant and vegetable kingdom and the mineral kingdom. There is still sentient life in all of them. It it's just that the degree of consciousness is different. And at the orthodox or the mass level for humanity, it is the planet Uranus which is the ruler of uh, Aquarius. And we'll be looking at the, the different rulerships shortly, but the glyph of the planet Uranus is that's conventionally how we look at the glyph of the planet Uranus and this is important um, because something was uh, um, uh, made quite clear about the one life and the role of Uranus in being that solar system point of focus for uh, the, the bringing down of the, uh, the fire of initiation. At the orthodox or mass level it is the planet Uranus that rules Aquarius and I'm going to call this the exoteric octave. And the function of this planet is for us to awaken ourselves from wherever we sleep. The Master Moira, the first ray master, writing in the Agni Yoga series of books, said, it is better to burn than to sleep. Referring to humanity's sleeping consciousness or the ability of humanity just to kind of sleepwalk through life without awakening to the spiritual possibilities. And to, to awaken ourselves, for, for, for the initiate, uh, those preparing on the path for initiation, uh, it is the initiate's job to the realisation of the deepest innate spiritual nature in themselves and then to pass it on to other people. So for the initiate is to awake and to awaken. There is a task there to awaken this, this, this spark uh, and, and this seed that, that lies deep within uh, the idea of a Uranian energy. But we have to work very hard to get to that point. Now Bailey states that in Aquarius humanity will take its initiation in groups and in her fine book The Rays and the Initiations uh, the Master Dwaj Kool outlines 14 rules for group initiation. And if you were to read them, you'd think, well, that's a lot of work to do. That's a lot of refinement of our consciousness and disciplining uh, uh, of our activities. 14 rules for group initiation. Initiation is intended to be for the many rather than for the few. And indeed, initiation 
is the key to the evolution of consciousness in this age. Because remember, the input of the extra system systemic fire will bring expansions in the life force. The life thread is situated in the, the, um, the heart and the consciousness thread is in the brain. And we're talking about vivifying and increasing the energy in both of those streams of energy by the process of initiation. We will look at this process in relation to the spirit or life level as characterised by the red line at the very top of the sheet that you have. Now, before we can get to this stage of starting to contemplate the, rec the receiving of Uranian energy and the lightning flash that it is, we have to go through the rounds of Saturn. Saturn, the planet Saturn, urges us on to personality integration. This idea of this bottom triangle of physical, emotional and mental. What is an integrated personality? A personality who's synthesised the ability to think mentally without emotion. So there's the plan and it's detached from emotion, it's a mental concept. Then the emotions are used not as something attaching or desirous, as a motive power to give life, force, energy to the mental plan. And finally, to be able to translate that healthy mix of mind and emotions, not the kamamanas, where the mind is tainted by the desires, but the deliberate use of the emotions to put life into the project or the idea or the, uh, the circumstances that require to be materialised, able to coordinate it on the physical plane to get results by organisation and order. And that's quite a task because the higher beings are not going to energise us unless we have got a, f a personality that cannot be fragmented. If we have a personality that could be They'll wait until we have the chance to do it. And Saturn will put us through it. Saturn will put us through it mainly because it is the ruler of long-term karma. And what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And normally with karma we can go through quite a difficult time of it. But we emerge with new qualities. And I call it creating points of tension. We really grow fast when we are put under tension. The personality doesn't like it, but we can grow very fast. And so part of Saturn's work is to uh, put us through this, and in doing this, it can control, constrict, and limit our life activities and we'll, until we have destroyed that personal dweller on the threshold of consciousness. Now that energy of negativity which we have embedded in our astral bodies and if we're all honest about it we know where the weaknesses are in our astral nature. Are we quick to temper? Are we intolerant? Are, 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 are we uh, uh, impatient when we don't get the results out of life? And of course there are far worse emotions related to resentment and jealousy, etc. And until these are dealt with, the personal dweller, then Saturn's work will continue unabated. Now, this idea of synthesizer is very important because Saturn is the lower synthesizer. Um, and if we think about synthesis, there's the animal's paw. You can't do a great deal with it. But morphology and esoteric astrology tell us that Saturn rules the thumb. You put a thumb into those four digits and you've suddenly got a huge range of motion and this thumb can synthesize what these fingers are doing. And that's Saturn's job, to synthesize those elements of your bodies or vehicles of consciousness, physical, emotional and mental. And we can all look and assess along the way how well we're doing with our own personality integration. Do, do the emotions dominate? And then a few seconds later say, wish I hadn't said that. Or cut down somebody with a sharp word. And that's when we find that we're misusing energy. And the misuse of energy uh, is, is strongly karmic. Um, and we'll, we'll find that we have to learn um, further on. And so this struggle to destroy our personal dweller on the threshold um, will be part of the road to synthesis. Um, 
This cosmic Saturnian principle has got a force attached to it, which is a physics, uh, it's a centripetal force. It is the force that causes constriction and pulls towards the centre. That's what centripetal is. And when we're under the influence of Saturn, we'll be reined in, reined in, reined in, dependent on the placement of Saturn, dependent on the way we're living our lives, etc. And we won't feel free. We can feel a lot of burdens. And this um, is related, in my understanding, to uh, the dark matter of the universe. I think that uh, science working bottom up and the masters working top down are starting to meet my understanding. I studied quite a lot of it in the last 20 years. Is that quantum physics is now hitting on what we would call the etheric level, and that there are further levels, emotional, mental, and spiritual, which will be the secrets of what the science is talking about dark matter and dark energy. But quite clearly, what has come through to me is that this cosmic Saturnian principle is related to the ability of dark matter uh, in its form producing um, role. Now, on to the second part of your handout, we have um, showing you there this hegemony of Saturn over Mercury, the human soul, looking to blend with its solar angel, Venus. And there's a very good article in the latest Esoterica, I think I'm right in saying, by Eric McGough on intuition, where he talks about the nature of the solar angels. And so this idea of the, of the merging of the human soul with the Deva counterpart to become the divine Hermaphrodite is actually what I've put down in there as the symbols happening still at the point in which Saturn is about to give over your synthesizing ability to Uranus. And so we have to go through the cycle of Saturn and the second Saturn return, which I passed a couple of years ago, is absolutely pivotal in this process. The opportunity can come at this particular time, which we will go into in some detail. And so when we have Mercury combining with Venus, and these are symbols, but the energies are very real, the divine Hermaphrodite, uh, up to this point, Saturn has been the doorkeeper on what we call the path of discipleship. So we've been integrating our personality, we've been paying off our karma, we've been constricted in our life's activities, but things are about to change and we're going to uh, become the soul-infused personality as the higher triangle and the lower triangle through an activated antakarana start to be brought together. Now, at the third initiation, it is, uh, it is possible for Uranus, therefore, to take over as the higher synthesizer. So, Saturn, the lower synthesizer, doing the work that's just been um, explained. And now we have Uranus as the higher synthesizing agent. And in complete and distinct contrast to Saturn, this is a cosmic Uranium principle, which demonstrates as centrifugal force. Now, this is the law of the attraction of the outer space rather than the law of attraction of the center, which is the centripetal force under Saturn. This offers the possibility of freedom for the human consciousness. And it's going to come at a point where our personalities have been brought in line with their own integration under Saturn and under the impulse of the soul brought together uh, in the process described with Mercury and Venus. And so this centrifugal force pulling outwards into space offers freedom as distinct from Saturn pulling inwards and limiting. And in this way, we can earn our spiritual freedom from the classroom of the earthly lessons where Saturn has been our teacher. And so we see that these planets appear to have different roles in our life, even though they are energies in the horoscope, energies um, uh, astronomically as well. And the cosmic uranium principle is the one that is, is behind the ability of dark energy to expand the universe. And we know that the scientists are talking about the rapid expansion of the universe, which in its nature is this centrifugal force. And of course, we as humans live in this balance between pulling inwards and matter, centripetal, and outwards and freedom and centrifugal. 
and the pivotal point is the third initiation. That's the initiation to be taken in groups in the age of Aquarius. Now, the symbol that I've been given for spirit and matter in this particular meditation was to say, take this symbol there as being the symbol of spirit, which is an eye like that, and matter like that. And there is a relationship between the two of them in the one life, spirit and matter. And if we turn that on its head, we have coincidentally, or maybe not, the symbol for Aquarius, uh, for Uranus, esoteric, um, exoteric ruler of Aquarius. And so we're bringing in the importance of the idea of the one life, hugely important in theosophical teachings, the one life. All life has consciousness, but at different degrees. And so we start to realise that we're going to be a lot closer to what the one life when we've started to activate within our, our situations and our life um, uh, positions the energy of Uranus. But it can't be done until Saturn has been dealt with in the fullness that's been described. And it can take many years and we might think we're not making too much progress as I... Uh, I would think, you know, it's year after year of the same old, etc. But w there are many more things going on be below the surface than we may realise. And so, using the symbols I for spirit and O for matter and relating them uh, as a spiritualization of matter, turning it on its side, we get the symbol for Uranus. And isn't it interesting to note that Uranus is the only planet that orbits on its side? And so the indications that come from the wisdom about the importance of the planet Uranus um, are very relevant uh, in, in, in my view and my suggestion. And I would call this the spiritualizing of matter because spirit and matter are related here and being brought together and de demonstrating um, the idea of the one life is the magic in the, uh, the seventh ray of um, order, organisation and magic, which we will be coming on to, on to. Now, in your sheets also, we have the lightning flash um, of the mountain top. Um, let's just see where we're up to with the sheets. Yes, I've given you on the second then the idea of the spiritualization of matter. And the third thing is the function of Uranus um, uh, to do um, the spiritualizing work the idea is that Uranus is the red lightning flash and it comes at the top of the mountain and so we can't receive it until we've climbed the mountain. And that mountain climb can be difficult. Madame Blavatsky famously said that when you tread the path of return, and this is the path of the mountain, the initiate, all that is good in you and all that is bad in you comes to the surface. And this is part of the expunging of the dweller on the threshold, but it's also part of us clearing out energies that are no longer required and redeeming the unredeemed psyche, which we all bring into life after life. And this important idea of forgiveness, the number of people who say to me, you know, can you look at brother in my chart? Oh, yes, it's, it's square to your son, difficult to the brother, yes. We haven't communicated in 20 years. I said, well, pick up the phone. No, why, why doesn't he pick up the phone to me? And there is an impasse. And the energy is caught up in the square. And that's what I mean by redemption. And it takes somebody to say, it doesn't matter. I said to a lady recently, I said... Um, she's talking about the difficulties with her husband and I said uh, can you compromise with your husband she said to me only if he's right the whole spirit of compromise is that you give ground and that's what we're required to do so often in order to redeem <clears throat> and so when we get to this point when we are passed over from the lower synthesizer of personality Saturn and the Lord of Karma, to the synthesizer of spirit and matter, Uranus. Uranus can then convey electric fire, the highest fire that is talked about as far as a faux hat, the highest fire, the, the, and it is an electrical charge. And I'm now going to use the idea of 
as above so below to say I'm going to relate this electrical uh, uh, fire faux hat to electricity in a circuit so, so a week ago I didn't think I would be doing this but here we are and we're going to look at two circuits do you remember any O level O level physics I'm not sure um, Again, Madame Blavatsky talked of the mystery of electricity. And that's what I'm relating to here uh, in these diagrams. Just before I do, I should point out that Uranus can convey electric fire or faux hat, and it comes through the crown chakra as spirit. At the base of the spine, we have the Kundalini energy. And if Uranus is positive, pole, spirit, Kundalini represents the negative or mother aspect or matter. And the roar of electric fire awakens and arouses Kundalini and she rises up the chakras, either Pingala and Shushumna central channel, to meet her mate as positive and, elect and negative electricity are in a power source, positive and ele electricity. That process cannot be safely undertaken if, unless there are no blocks in the chakras. And it's important that we don't seek Kundalini experience before, by other methods, and rather wait for the roaring of the, uh, 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 of the electric fire to stimulate the, the Kundalini at the base. And Uranus is in charge of that process. And so electricity can flow through resistance points arranged in either series or in parallel. And this is in series where we just have two resistors, R1 and R2, and you have it on your sheet there as well. The overall resistance in this circuit is greater because these add together and if one of these resistors fails then this light goes out. Now the other way of arranging things is in parallel. In parallel you see that if one of the resistors fails the light will still stay on. Here the circuit can flow uh, in either, the, sorry, the current can flow in either or both circuits because the resistors are connected independently of each other and the power source uh, is able to get to both resistors whether one or other of them fails. My suggestion is that in taking this idea and relating electric fire to electricity these circuits are analogous to spiritual ages. And in Pisces, we have this kind of arrangement of our energy when the path to Godhead, the power source, was controlled by somebody else, a priest, a religious order, whatever it was, a group of initiates. You couldn't get there yourself in the age of Pisces. You were told to believe and have faith. And therefore, this circuit demonstrates a more limited uh, uh, approach to, um, to energy and to uh, contact with higher sources. In Pisces then the series operating uh, to Godhead is through another church, religion etc. In the Aquarian group, which is the resistors in parallel, we have our own path to Godhead. We don't need to go through another and we're working not on faith and belief but on knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And so the role of the Theosophical Society becomes absolutely central in directing people to find the source for themselves, which is what Theosophy has always done. There is no religion higher than truth. But in the age of Aquarius, this is going to be emphasised and pronounced. And again, is it a coincidence that there's the glyph of Aquarius in this series? These are not my thoughts. These are what's been impressed in meditation on the seed thought of the violet flame.
And so I share it with you in, in the spirit of Aquarius and let you make up your own mind. So the Aquarian group, we have parallel operating where we all have individual access to Godhead and we don't have to go through another. Note the two resistors in parallel make up the, the symbol or the glyph for Aquarius. Now, at the highest level, this is equivalent to humanity having direct access to Shambhala. Remember, we have at the green level, humanity as a group. At the blue level, the Buddhic stage, we have the hierarchy of masters and other beings as well, uh, including our guides. And then we have Shambhala. This is referred to in the Great Invocation. Shambhala is where the will of God is known. And Uranus and the first ray and the, uh, the, the electric fire are fires of will. And the divine plan can only be motivated by an understanding of divine will as motivated by love. When we look at our willful actions, we have to blend and merge them with the heart activity of love, which is very much the, my theme of my talk at the summer school last year, embracing the dragon of wisdom and the second ray of love wisdom. In many ways, this is a complementary talk about the importance of the factor of will. But if your will and what you do as a result of your will is based on a heart which is compassionate and embracing all in complete accordance with the first of the three objectives of the Theosophical Society, then we know that our will will be directed in the right direction. And we will, when we're passed on to the highest synthesizer of Uranus, be able to be energized further in that work. And so at a personal level, freedom from the influence of Saturn is the key to the process. Will you focus all your attention on matters that may prolong physical survival at all costs, out of fear of health afflictions and facing death? Because there is the danger that individuals getting to the point of the Saturn return, and that second Saturn return happens around age 59. Saturn goes round the chart 29 and a half years, and your physical body is at its strongest, and Saturn will reap a lot of karma back in that first round. And then it will do another round of 29 and a half years. And in that time, at 59, you've got the chance of having paid off the karma the long-standing karma that was there in Tablets of Stone to be actually dealt with. And this is the point we're talking about. What is your attitude at age 59 towards survival and what you're going to do with the rest of your life? Because the danger that individuals could contract in consciousness and become a, a burden on the next generation, a Victor Meldew type, was dropped into my consciousness, that face of that complaining man about things becoming a burden on the next generation. This is the challenge, I believe, that each individual faces at their second Saturn return, because the alternative, in absolute accordance with the age of Aquarius, is to continue to expand and give out the harvest of what you've learned in your life in form to people and in consciousness in the way you view things, in a generous outpouring that ensures the continuous flow of evolutionary development. And that is what evolution is about. It is about the continuity of the flow of energy. But our survival fears may get in the way. We haven't got enough money. We can't do this. We go, uh, uh, and we start to, to, to contract because we want to survive. And that is as I see it, not the way of evolution, because energy is not being given out in the way that it could be. And so it's down to this, I believe. We have to face death psychologically and accept it at the second Saturn return. And if we do, in true Uranian terms, it frees us for the rest of our lives. And if we don't make that decision to be free of the fears, 
the dweller may still be there, the fears, the concerns about survival, about our health, etc. We forego the opportunity to give out our life energy in the most way. And so it's a shift from the personal to the impersonal. And again, the impersonal uh, energy uh, um, offering is part of the Aquarian age. Not so much what you can do to enrich your life. What can you do to enrich the lives of others? And it just goes beyond humans it goes down to all the kingdoms of nature and this is being truly participative of the one life if we accept the one life as a mental concept we have to live it in practice and that means not being over concerned about our own personal situation and my view is the, the less concerned you are about your own personal situation the more you get given to support that situation because you are giving out energy and it gets replenished under the law of, I think it's called, infinite supply. So once death is faced psychologically at this Saturn return, it is not necessarily followed by physical death, but the passage is one into a new phase of life. In truth, described to me as the golden years, because death has been accepted and so survival fears no longer control the direction of the life. Gratitude, appreciation, generosity of spirit flow, and then the soul or consciousness is able to give its contribution into the community. All this happens once the doorkeeper Saturn is passed and Uranus is starting to awaken us to our true spiritual inheritance. And just to finish off with the last part, I wanted to talk to you about the rays and the Euroboros. The Euroboros is the symbol of the snake um, biting its tail. And it's very useful um, uh, in the Bailey teachings to see how she uses the rays. There we have the snake. I don't think I got O level arse. <laughs> um, we have ray one, ray two, ray three, ray four in the centre, the bouncing one, five, six and seven. I just want to point your attention to the proximity, if we number the rays in this way, of ray one will empower and ray seven, the violet of the seventh order of organisation and magic. Uh, ray one will empower, predominantly found in the sign of Aries, Aries is the hierarchical ruler of Uranus. We have hierarchical, esoteric and orthodox rulers in astrology, according to Dwarsh Kuhl. And Ray 7, Order and Magic, is predominantly found in the sign of Aquarius, which is ruled orthodoxy by Uranus. And so Uranus has this idea of both rays working together. This is working at the highest level of spirit, the monadic level, and this is working to spiritualise matter. And the two are going to work together in the Aquarian age. And the other ray, of course, that the Jupiter brings in is ray two, which is the heart. And we have the, the will, the head and the heart nicely brought together in a synthesis that will see us through. And rays one and seven have a close affinity with each other. And this is what this is showing here. Finally, I have been informed that the real brotherhood of Aquarian age is not just the brotherhood of souls, which we like to think it is, and it is that. It's also one of spirit. And the talk today through the medium of the planet Uranus and its relationship to us after we've passed the doorkeeper Saturn is very much talk about spirit rather than soul. It extends well beyond the human kingdom into the kingdoms of nature where there are degrees of consciousness to include all life and all consciousness at our root we are the one life I've given it or been given the symbol I related to O Uranus on his side and so is everyone and everything regardless of their state of development in consciousness and we are human because we've been through other states of consciousness as well. And we are all going through that flow. The kingdoms of nature are very important that we have a responsibility to help them with the further integration of consciousness. I believe that when we truly experience this idea of the interconnectedness of all life through the idea of the one life in action, then the role of humanity in the cosmos will become much more self-evident. Thank you very much for your attention.